All right, gang, let's start into chapter four. And we're going to configure storage and file systems in this chapter. Our outcomes, our objectives, we're going to describe server storage, be able to configure local disks, work with virtual disks, describe file sharing, configure Windows file sharing, and secure access to files with permissions. So an overview of server storage. Now, there's a need for faster, bigger, and more, more reliable storage. And that, that need grows as fast as technology can keep up. Now, we've got different sections where we're going to go over the basics, what it is, why you need it, and common methods for accessing storage. So what is it? Well, generally, storage is considered any medium data can be written to and retrieved from. Now, long-term storage includes USB memory sticks or flash drives, secure digital cards or SD cards, compact flash or CF cards, CDs and DVDs, magnetic tape, solid state drives, and hard disk drives. Now, server storage is based on hard disk drives primarily. Although solid state drives are gaining popularity, the cost is holding them back. Now, a solid state drive uses flash memory and the same type of high speed interfaces as traditional hard disks. Usually, it uses SATA or SATA Express interfaces, has no moving parts, requires less power, and is faster and more resilient to shock than HDDs are. Now, why do we store? Now, operating system files, the OS itself requires a good bit of storage. And depending on the version of the OS or what the OS is, but a good bit is several gig. Now, a page file uses virtual memory and it stores information uh, that's short-term memory um, similar to RAM but it's it's stored on the hard disk we've got log files log files change size dynamically depending on how the system is used we've got virtual machines they exist in storage on our hard disks and they need space to store files for the virtual hard disks or virtual machines themselves. Now we've got database storage. It, it stores, the demands could vary depending on the type of database and how much data exists within the database. Uh, traditionally, databases are not small storage uh, components within a system. Now user documents, uh, it might be the, the largest use of disk space is user documents whether it's videos files whatever it may be um, if you think about on your phone what takes most most of the storage on your mobile device now and it's traditionally uh, music and, and, and pictures and things of the like it has it's not the operating system or the apps that's beating you up it's usually the little stuff that we style we store those user documents or user files there are three broad categories of disk or storage access methods. There's local storage and direct attached storage. Things that are attached or fixed connections to the system unit. We've got network attached storage or NAS and that's a remote storage and we've got a storage area network which is multiple locations across the network to perform our storage or locations as a store. A local, store, local storage, as I said, uh, exclusive connection to the, consist, the computer systems board through a disk controller, um, usually refers to HDDs or SDDs, or I should say SSDs. All right. Got a little typo there, Greg. Now, provides rapid and exclusive access to the system unit itself. Now, the disadvantage is it's only the system where it's installed has the direct access to it. Now, that doesn't mean we can't uh, create shares on that disk. 
It just means that the only that system has the direct access to it. Any other connection is uh, contingent upon network connectivity. We've got direct access storage is similar to local storage, but can also refer to one or more HDDs and an enclosure with its own power supply. Um, a friend of mine's got something that would fit in this, and that would be his um, personal cloud. And we've also got a, a DAS with its own enclosure and power supply. It can usually be configured as a disk array, such as RAID configuration. And this, depending on how it's connected, this could be that buddy of mine's cloud. Some DAS devices have multiple interfaces so that more than one computer can access the storage medium sim simultaneously. And we've got network attached storage. This is not connected to a direct client machine. It could be connected to a server, but uh, generally it's uh, it could be a, uh, a domain member that's just it's, it's just clearly a storage server. Um, and NAS is typically dedicated to file sharing. NAS shares files through standard network protocols such as SMB, NFS, and FTP. We've also got SAN, a storage area network, uses high-speed high networking to uh, technologies to give servers fast access to large amounts of shared disk storage. Most common network technology used in SANs are Fiber Channel and ISCSI. SANs uses the concept of logical unit number, or LUN, to identify a unit of storage. So here we're looking at a SAN. Now if we're going to configure local disks, it can be divided into two categories, a physical disk or a logical disk. Now, we've got some terminology that's unique to disk storage. Disk drive is the physical component with a disk interface connector and a power connector. So that would be HDD or an SSD. Those are disk drives. A volume is a logical unit of storage that can be formatted with a file system. Now, what we're dealing with is NTFS. A disk drive can contain one or more volumes. Now partitions, that's an older term that means the same thing as a volume, but is used for basic disks. Now formatting, that prepares a disk with a file system used to organize and store files. FAT, FAT32, NTFS. HDD capacities are now measured in hundreds of gigabytes. Four terabyte disks are common today. Factors that affect the speeds of HDDs, disk interface technology, rotation speeds. Um, the traditional speeds should be about 7,200 RPMs, but they can exceed that with 10 to 15,000 RPMs. The amount of cache memory installed would be 32 or 64 meg, meg cache um, when it comes to servers. The things we need to take into consideration when we're dealing with disk capacity. Windows installation should be on a separate disk uh, from the data. An SSD is a good choice for Windows installation. But then again, as I said, it's a cost issue. Using RAID as fault tolerance option will combine multiple disks to make a single volume. Overall storage capacity is diminished, but uh, that redundancy helps us if we're trying to be more reliable should an issue occur. So disk interface technologies. We've got SATA, SAS, and SCSI. And we also got PATA, but Server 2016 is not compatible with PATA. Now, SATA. It's replaced ATA or PATA, parallel ATA. Um, the advantages 
It's faster transfer times and a smaller cable size. And I always note that it, with that smaller cable size, PADA cables were ribbons, if you will. And they could have impacted our airflow through the system unit itself. Now the current sta standard 3.2 for SATA supports speeds up to 16 gigabits per second. Now it's most readily available devices, they support SATA 2 or SATA 3. Now small computer system interface or SCSI drives. It's a parallel bus technology. It's still used on some servers, but it's reached its performance limits. Okay. You know, it supported up to 640 meg transfer rates. We've got serial SCSI, SAS. It's a newer form of SCSI, which transfer rates up to six gig and higher. Now SATA drives can be connected to SAS backplanes. A backplane is a connection system that uses a printed circuit board instead of traditional cables to carry signals. Now a volume can use some or all of the space on an HDD or an SDD, we'll just say a disk drive, um, or a single volume can span multiple drives. Two Microsoft specific volume definitions. We've got a boot volume and a system volume. System volume, that's for the OS, and a boot volume is for the boot partition or the boot files. Now, we noted this before when we talked about the installation. Server will create two specific volumes for us, a boot volume and a system volume on the disk drive. So the boot volume will have our boot files and the system volume will have our OS files. Okay. So we'll see them here. C is our OS specific and we see here we've got boot page everything on C and we don't see them separated. We've got a recovery partition We've got an EFI system in here. A basic disks, it accommodates only basic volumes, or they're called simple volumes. It can't hold volumes spanning multiple disks or be part of a RAID. As we call them basic. Now, volumes on a basic disk are called partitions because that's the way things used to be. They were partitions. We'll call them volumes now. So it can support a maximum of four partitions. The first three are primary partitions and the fourth is called an extended partition. A primary partition can be assigned a drive letter, be marked active, and contain a Windows system volume. An extended partition must be divided into logical drives. Now partitioning methods, now Windows offers two methods. We can use the MBR master boot record. It's the most common method that's been around since DOS. It's been oh, decades. Now it supports volume sizes up to two terabyte. Now if you get beyond two terabytes, we've got GUID partitioning table or GPT. It supports volume sizes up to 18 exabytes. That's a, an exabyte is a million terabytes. Now it became an option in Windows Server 20, 2008 and Vista, and starting with Server 2016, new disks are initialized using GPT. But you can select MBR if you want to. Now, GPT offers improved reliability through partition table replication and CRC, or Cyclical Redundancy Check Protection of the partition table. So it checks to make sure that um, everything is the way that it's supposed to be with uh, CRC check. Okay, we got disk sector sizes. The storage space on disk drives is divided into sectors. And sectors are combined by the file system into clusters. That's when the disk is formatted. Now Windows Server 2016 supports disks with 
512 byte sectors, but it also supports advanced format disks that use 4096 byte sectors. Now, this allows Windows to support much larger volume sizes than previously possible using the 512 byte sectors. Now, Windows Server 2016 also supports a hybrid version of advanced format disks called 512E drives. Now, it's a, that disk is configured with 4096 byte physical sectors, but it can emulate 512 byte sectors to support systems that can't use a 4096 byte sector. Here we go. We've got a command prompt showing the different types and volumes. Okay. We've got different volumes. We've got a simple volume, a span volume, a striped volume, a mirrored volume, and a RAID 5 volume. So a simple volume resides on one single disk. It doesn't matter if it's basic or dynamic. A spanned volume extends across two or more physical disks. A striped volume extends across two or more dynamic disks. And a mirrored volume uses space from two dynamic disks and provides fault tolerance. Everything written to one disk is duplicated or mirrored to the second disk. If one disk fails, the other has an identical copy of it. You can take the failed drive out plug another good drive in, repair the mirror, and now you have two good functioning drives again. Now, that's RAID level 1. Now we've got RAID level 5. And RAID level 5, it uses space from three or more dynamic disks and uses disk striping with parity. Now, parity information is used to recreate lost data after a disk failure. So everything that's written is written twice, but not on the same drive. So we've got three drives. I could write something to drive one and drive two, drive two and three, uh, drive two and one. Doesn't matter which two, as long as it's written to two drives. Now, using this logic or this technology, any one of those drives fails, that drive can be repaired based on the data written on the other drives. Now, it doesn't matter if we got two or ten other drives that are within this RAID. Okay. That drive will self-repair and we're back up and running. We've also got RAID level 10 and that's RAID 5 that is mirrored. Um, Formatting creates the directory structure needed to organize files and store information about each file. Now the file system defines the method and format an operating system uses to store, locate, and retrieve files from electronic storage media. Now Windows supports three file systems. Windows does. Server 16 doesn't. So the first, FAT, and there's also a FAT32. We've got NTFS, that's a dominant on Windows servers. And we've got one of the newer ones, Resilient File Systems, or REFS. Now, modern file systems have some or all of the following component, components. They've got a file naming convention, things need to be a certain way, hierarchical organization, storage method, uh, metadata, attributes, and access control list, or ACLs. File systems vary in whether and how each component is used. Now, if we talk about FAT systems, FAT file systems, there's FAT16 and FAT32. FAT16 is generally just referred to as FAT, and it's limited to 2 gig partitions. FAT32 can go up to 2 terabytes in size, but anything Windows 2000 and later uh, limits the size of FAT32 to 32 gig. That's a performance issue. FAT32 supports files up to 4 gig in size. Um, the limitations of FAT. Now, the file size limitation, that's, that's a game changer. That's huge. Um, it prevents storing a DVD image file on a FAT system. 
Now, it doesn't support file and folder permissions for users and groups. That's NTFS. It lacks the support of encryption, file compression, disk quotas, and reliability features. That's simple, and it's got little overhead. It's still the file choice uh, on removable data like flash drives. Now, when it comes to NTFS, that's been around for decades, first introduced in Windows NT back in the 90s. It supports file and folder permissions, and it's got an advantage over FAT. Now, NTFS is new technology file system. The features added with the release of Windows 2000 is disk quotas, volume mount points, shadow copies, file compression, and EFS, encrypting file system. Now, the newest one is REFS, or Resilient File System. Now, the main use is in large file sharing applications where volumes are managed by storage spaces. REFS does not support file compression disk quota in EFS. Windows can't be booted from an REFS volume. It supports volumes up to one Yodabyte. YB. REFS works with storage spaces to automatically repair disk failure caused by corruption. The disk format of choice for storing virtual disks for use in storage spaces on Hyper-V servers is REFS. Now, it's not meant to be a replacement for NTFS. Each one has its own specific niche. Now, if we're going to prepare a new disk for use, we've got hot add or what we call hot swap, being able to add a new HDD or SSD to a server while it's powered on. Now, Windows Server supports hot adding as long as the server hardware supports it. After the disk drive has been attached to the server, <coughs> excuse me, use the disk management snap-in or the file and storage services to make the disk accessible. By default, new disks must be initialized and brought online. Afterwards, you can create a volume and format it. Now, in disk management, you can convert the disk to dynamic or between an MBR or GPT partitioning scheme. Most of this that we've been talking about is done through a GUI when we're dealing with the desktop experience. But these things can all get done in PowerShell. Now we've got the commandlets for PowerShell and we've got get disk, set disk, new partition, format volume, they're all commandlets for PowerShell to modify or uh, create partitions on drives, managing drives. Now, if we're going to work with virtual disks, a VHD file, it's a format for virtual machines running in Hyper-V. They use virtual disks. Now, a VHD file can also be created and mounted with disk management and used like a physical disk. A VHD can also be mounted by double clicking it in File Explorer. Virtual disks are portable. VHD files can be copied to any location for the purposes of backing up data or allowing it to be used by another computer. Now VHD versus VHDX format. Now, the differences between VHD and VHDX. All right, VHD supports virtual disks up to 2 terabytes, whereas VHDX supports up to 64 terabytes. VHDX uses the 4096-byte logical sector, sector size compared to VHD using that 512. VHDX disks you can store custom metadata about the disk, indicating information like the OS version, the build number, things like that. It's resilient to power, power failure because it tracks updates in the metadata. Now, you can convert a VHD disk to VHDX using Hyper-V Manager or PowerShell. Now, here we are with Hyper-V Manager. Okay. And we can come over selecting a virtual machine we edit the disk within the system 
compact it, convert it, or expand it. Now, we've got dynamically expanded and fixed size disks. If we're talking about a virtual disk, which ones, and I've talked about this in, in some of the previous chapters. Now, let's say I have a 500 gig host machine hard disk. If I have a virtual disk on there that's dynamic, um, I can set the range on how, how large it can be, the maximum size, and it will dynamically expand up to that space. And it'll grow to the maximum size as long as there's room for it. Now, it doesn't mean that space cannot be used. Right. Now, a fixed size disk reserves that space and it can't be used by anything else. And it, it it's like it sets stakes around all that space on the disk drive. It generally occupies contiguous clusters, reducing host disk fragmentation. And it's best used in production environments that require fast disk performance. Now, an overview of file sharing. File and print sharing functions are in the file and storage services role. Windows clients access shared files and printers by using SMB or server message block. That's a client server application layer protocol that provides network file sharing, network printing, and authentication. It's a common variation of SMB is called Common Internet File System or CIFS. Windows 2016 also supports NFS or network file system. NFS is the native sharing protocol in Unix and Linux OSs. Now, a server for NFS is a role found in file and storage services. Now, you need to be installed in order to support the clients using NFS protocol, but that's something that we've done in server 2016 because Microsoft has seen the value by um, working with Linux rather than against. So we're able to create Linux virtual machines. We're able to communicate with Linux. You'll see a lot of Linux popping up in Server 2016 and future versions. Now, if we're going to create a Windows file share, we've got folders in Windows Server 2016 can be shared only by members of the administrators or server operators groups. Now you can go into simple file sharing, advanced file sharing, or advanced sharing dialog box, shared folder snap in, and file and storage services. Here's file sharing where we can go in and change it, read, rewrite, or remove, advanced sharing, and we can create shares and set a number of sharing options with the new share wizard. In the file and storage service role, We've got five options for setting the share profile. Now, SMB, that share can be quick, SMB share advanced, SMB share applications. We've also got NFS share quick and NFS share advanced. So here we are with new share wizard, and there's the five that we just talked about. And the description will pop up explaining, so in case you're not clear on which one's which, I'll explain it to you so you can choose the right one. Now you can set some additional options for an SMB share. You can enable access based enumeration, allow caching of the share, and encrypt data access. We can set permissions on it as well. And here you can see, here's the permissions, and we can say who gets to do what when it comes to access on this new share. And we can manage shares with the shared folder snap-in and the MMC. And the shared folder snap-in has shares, sessions, and open files subnodes. We can use PowerShell commandlets when it comes to shares and do everything that we did through that GUI and the MMC and other areas just by running these commandlets in PowerShell. And here's the different commandlets and the description when it comes to shares and files. 
All right. The default in administrative shares, administrative shares, <coughs> excuse me, are hidden shares created by Windows that are available only to members of the administrators group. There's the admin, and you'll see that dollar sign. Dollar sign. That, that'll come up later. We'll talk about it here in, in a little bit. And we've got Drive, and we've got IPC. Okay. Now, a domain controller can have all of the above plus NetLogon and SysVol. Now, for shared resources to be useful, users must know how to access them. Common methods of accessing shared folders to UNC Path, Active Directory Search, Mapping a Drive, or browsing the network. And we've talked about this before. NFS, a file sharing protocol that allows users to access files and folders on other computer across the network. The native file sharing system found on Linux and Unix is NFS. It makes network resources seem to be part of the local file system instead of being remote. Windows Server 2016 supports an NFS server component as a role service under the file and storage services role. And it also has an NFS client component as well. So a network file system or NFS, we can install and configure it through the NFS advanced sharing. We can implement an NFS data store. Um, when we've got a failover cluster that provides highly available storage solution for applications using NFS, to implement that store, we've got to install file services role. Um, the server for NFS role service and the failover clustering feature. We'd have to create a failover cluster, configure the file server role in that failover cluster manager, and we've got to add an NFS file share to that cluster and failover cluster manager. So configuring NFS in PowerShell, here's our commandlets and a description of what it would do. So new NFS share will create a new NFS share. So it seems in some instances, it's, it's quick. As long as I know the commands, we can just power it right on through in, in PowerShell and we don't have to navigate to go find any specific interfaces. But the catch is you've got to remember all these commandlets. Now, securing access to files with permissions. There's two ways. We can have share permissions and file and folder permissions. And per permissions specify which user can access the file system and how they can access it. Share permissions apply when using a network to access shared folder files. File and folder permissions always apply whether accessing network shares or local files. There's three types of objects or security principles that can be assigned permissions to access a file system. We've got users, groups, and computers. And object security settings have three components that make up its security descriptor. There's discretionary access control list, there's an object owner, and a system access control list. Now the discretionary access control list is a list of security principles each has permissions that define access to an object. Access control entry, an entry in a discretionary access control list. There's an object owner, usually the user account that created the object, or a group or user who's been assigned ownership of the object. And you can transfer ownership from uh, one, one user to another. Now, System Access Control List, SACL, defines the setting for auditing access to an object. Now, how do we assign permissions? The user creates the object. The user's account is added to the object's DACL. Now, it's called explicit permission. A group the user belongs to is added to the object's DACL. Permission is inherited from the DACL of a parent object the user group or user or group has been added to. Now there's effective permissions 
share permissions apply to folders and files accessed across the network. Um, can't be configured on individual files. So we've got three types of share permissions. There's read, change, and full control. Generally, the default share is read for everyone. It's kind of like you can read it, but you can't change it. And here we are. Here's the three chain or three permissions when it comes to a share. So file and folder permissions, basic permissions: read, read and execute. This is for file and folders. We can list folder contents, write, modify, and full control. Now those are the six basic permissions. There's also 14 advanced permissions. That's when it comes to folders. Files have five basic permissions and 13 advanced. Now file ownership, you can create the file or folder, take ownership of the file or folder, and you can also assign ownership. You've got permission inheritance, and it gets kind of tricky when we're moving things around or um, adding things to an existing folder that somebody's already been assigned partition, uh, the permissions to. So here we are with advanced security settings for some folder. Okay. Here's advanced security settings again, and now we're on the effective access tab. Now, we can deny permissions, but we've got to be careful about how we deny things and, and, and who we deny. Okay. Um, now, there's rules when it comes to copying and moving files and folders uh, within or between a volume. And we've got five different rules that we've got to deal with. Now, let's start out with the first one. A file or folder copied within the same NTFS volume or to a different NTF volume inherits the permissions from the destination folder. So if the destination is more restrictive or less restrict restrictive, that folder that's being copied inherits the destination folder's permissions. A file or folder moved within the same NTF NTFS volume retains its original permissions. So if it's just moving around the same volume, it retains its same permissions. A file or folder moved to a different NTFS volume inherits the destination folder's permissions. Now, it, let's say we have a file or folder moved from FAT or FAT32 to an NTFS permission. It inherits the destination folder's permissions. But if we go the other direction, a file moved or copied from NTFS to FAT or FAT32, all the permissions disappear. Okay? Going from NTFS to FAT or FAT32, it's not backward compatible. So storage is any digital media that data can be written to and later retrieved from. All computers require at least some storage, but servers usually require more than client computers. The main methods of storage access are local, DAS, NAS, and SAN. Configuration of local disks can be divided into two broad categories. We've got physical disk properties and logical properties. Disk types include basic disks and dynamic disks. Windows Server 2016 can mount virtual disks and use them just like a regular volume. The file server role service is required to share folders. There are two types of permissions to restrict access to files and folders. We've got share and NTFS. There are several ways for client computers to access shared folders. We can use the UNC path. We could do an active directory search, map a drive, and browse the network. Every recent OS includes administrative shares. There are hidden shares available to members of the administrators group. 
Now we've got NFS. It's a file sharing protocol that allows users to access files and folders on other computers across the network. Three types of objects can be assigned permissions to access the file system. Users, groups, and computers. Permissions are assigned in four ways. The user creates an object. The user account is added to the DACL. A group the user belongs to is added to the DACL. And finally, there are three share permissions. Three share permissions. Read, change, and full control. Now that's on a file share. Okay? So, I'll see you in the next chapter. Doing a great job.